Can you please explain that? How, uh, what okay. is the relevance of that? Yeah. Okay. Now VWAP in US institutional trading, VWAP is everything. Now yeah. you had my buddy, Brian Shannon on there. Yeah. On right. The love Brian. He got me addicted to that anchored VWAP. Yeah. You know, it, th that anchored VWAP's like eating potato chips. You can't just eat one. I almost had four screens going because he got me. I was anchoring all over the place. So I had to calm <laughs> down on that, right? But it's very good. Now, VWAP is the institutional benchmark. Now, if you're my client and you tell me, listen, JJ, go buy me a million shares of Microsoft today, right? Mm -hmm. I will try and get you prices under VWAP. Right. If you tell me to sell a million shares, I will try and get you prices above VWAP. So you call me tomorrow to give me another trade that I can work. Yeah. Right? That's how it works. Traders are judged by their execution against VWAP. Hello, 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 my dear friends. This is your friend Vivek Bajaj, co-founder of Stockage and Elon Market and curator of India's top finance podcast called Face to Face. Welcome to yet another Face to Face Global. And this time also I present to you fantastic, fantastic interaction I'm going to have with someone very special. You would love this interaction. And if you really want to get the full benefit out of this interaction, you stay till the end because the real concept will be discussed throughout this video. Well, uh, we have heard about various animals in this market. Yeah, it's a jungle. You have bull, you have bear, you have lion. But have you ever heard about a gorilla? A gorilla strategy in financial market? Well, today we are going to talk to a gorilla who has his own unique strategy of trading financial markets and he is doing very good in whatever he is doing in whichever market he is trading and uh, he is outside India you can judge from my uh, introduction but he has Indian roots so very excited to talk to this gentleman who has a very unique display pick we will not be able to see him because of certain reasons which we will come to know while we talk to him let me welcome the guest for this face to face, JJ Akka Surendra. Hello, JJ. Thank you. Hello so much. Thank you so much for having me. It's uh, it's an honor to be with you. I'm excited. I'm super excited, and you must have seen the superlative excitement inside my voice, isn't it? Yes, uh, I love getting together with people and talking about trading, and I've been looking forward to this for quite a while. Thank you. Uh, so tell me two things. One. Um, the, the secret behind Gorilla and the other, the secret behind JJ. Uh, what happened was I was born in Sri Lanka. Uh, my mom's from Bangalore. My grandmother's from Andhra and my father was from Colombo. So I was born in Sri Lanka, but they brought me to Canada when I was three years old back in 1970. And so I grew up um, in the middle of Canada, which is a place called Saskatchewan. And, um, you know, Surendra is my first name, but it was horribly mispronounced. So when I got to school, um, my middle name is Joseph. So everyone just called me Joe. It was just so much easier for the Canadians. I felt sorry for them. And because I was the only East Indian kid in my whole school. Okay. And, uh, you know, so I was Joe and uh, it was easy for them. And so I grew up there in the prairies um, and uh, prairie life is a little different. It's very cold there right now. It's about minus 45, minus 50 Celsius. Um, in the summertime, it's about plus 30. Um, it's farmland. So all of my friends are like these huge Ukrainian, um, German, you know, or European people who came, from, you know, from farm backgrounds. So they're big. So I grew up playing American football. Um, you know, eating their food, lifting weights with them. And uh, as of course, every East Indian parent uh, tries to get their kid to be a doctor. Uh, everyone in my family is pretty much in the medical field. So they, I took four years of microbiology, but I just was not good for it. So um, yeah, I moved to Vancouver after living in Regina for uh, 20 years and after university with three friends. And I ended up working in a nightclub uh, as a bouncer. 
you know, the guy oh. at the front door. Yeah, you know, who babysits drunk people. And I was doing that at, at night. And in the morning, I was uh, working with an organic chemist uh, making shampoo and things like that. So I had, you know, two different jobs because Vancouver is expensive. You had to do at least two or three jobs to live, you know, when you're young. And um, that's when um, I met some traders from the Vancouver Stock Exchange. They used to come to the nightclub. And um, because the pretty girls used to go to the nightclub, so traders follow pretty girls like a school of fish. And uh, so uh, they got talking to me, and one of them gave me Liar's Poker, uh, the very first book that Michael Lewis, who wrote The Big Short. Absolutely. It's a great book, yeah. I was hooked. Um, And I was like, this is what I want to do now. It took me a while to get in the industry, and I did it in a very sort of roundabout way. Um, I, I stopped working at the nightclub because it was getting dangerous and I got a government job. I was working at the government, um, you know, just because it was right next to the stock exchange. I I got that idea from Linda Ratchke in, uh, you know, Linda Bradford Ratchke. She said she got a job and I read it in Market Wizards and I said, I'll do the same. So I went and got a job next to the stock exchange working for the government. And there was a, there was a little East Indian man and love the guy. He was a stock promoter. And he was just this tiny little guy and he used to wear black suits with cowboy boots, drove a black Rolls Royce. And his assistant was this six foot tall blonde. So they, everywhere they looked, like Vancouver was full of characters because it was a mining town. There was, you know, penny stock was the big thing. And he saw me reading the Wall Street Journal one day and he said, hey kid, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I want to be a trader. He goes, come see me after work. Um, so we worked in the same building. He had seen me in the elevator and, uh, I went up to his, his office and he said, well, you know, what do you want to do? And, and, uh, you know, do you need an office? And I said, listen, you put me in the janitor's closet and give me a cardboard box to sit on and a phone. I'm ready to work. I don't care. He said, you're hired. And so I started working leads after I'd, I'd work a full day at the government. Then I'd go up to his office. And what I'd do is I'd call people who were interested in buying his mining stock. And I, w- I was the opener. You know, if you've ever seen a boiler room thing, there's one guy who calls the client, says, are you interested, sends the information. That was me. And then the next day, somebody would call to close and get them to actually buy stock. So that's what I started out with. And he got me my first job working for the company that actually produced the leads. Mm -hmm. So I left the government. I went to this company called Stockdeck Communications. And that's where I got the name JJ. My boss gave me that name. And um, he trained me how to sell. And so all our clients were public companies stock promoters, uh, finance people, you know, people who would take a company public and they would have the cheap stock from the founder stock, right? And then they'd take it public and sell it into retail buying. And we would generate that retail buying. Back in the old days before the internet, it was called direct mail. So we, you know, send out these direct mail packages with company profiles. People would send back expressions of interest. Now that's a warm lead. So then you get a broker to call and say, you're interested in this stock. And then they try and get to close the person to buy the stock. Very difficult, hard work, you know. So I had about 200 companies as public clients, uh, as clients, public companies, uh, investment, small little investment banks, financiers. And I remember asking my boss, you know, and he, I said, you know, which one of these stocks should I buy? You know, what's a good, he's like, JJ, you don't buy stock, you sell it. Oh. <laughs> And this is the first lesson I ever learned. He's like, you don't buy stock, you sell it. I'm like, well, how do you sell it if you don't buy it? Yeah. He goes, they give it to you for free. You don't have to buy stock. You work for a company, they give you stock, right? It's free stock, you just sell it, right? And that's how we do business, right? You know, everything's, you know, people used to buy houses in Vancouver and pay for it with stock, right? So the, one of our clients was this Punjabi guy who had come from Africa and he and his three brothers became billionaires. They started in the mailroom of brokerage firms, did deals, got them up to NASDAQ, and actually became billionaires. And he was one of my best clients. And um, he gave me the nickname Gorilla because I was 265 pounds. I was a bodybuilder, weightlifter kind of guy. So because I grew up with these big farm boys, right? I'm a little bit bigger than the average East Indian person, you know, they fed us a lot of red meat and, you know, and lifted weights and played football. So he called me Gorilla. And, uh, you know, he gave me that name and he taught me pretty much everything about the business, how to take a company public, how to develop a market, how to create a market so you could sell stock into it, all of that sort of thing. And I was his trader for a number of years and I was with him when he made his first 50, $100 million, $200 million and, and so on. And, uh, and I worked at a brokerage firm in Vancouver, which was kind of a, a brokerage firm. There was a small firm. Uh, we didn't have Goldman Sachs and I didn't have an MBA from Harvard or Wharton or 
any of those things. I had four years of microbiology <laughs> because my parents wanted me to go to med school. And so I, uh, you know, I started at this brokerage firm and how I got that job was one of my friends was dating the head trader. And, she, you know, we went out for dinner one night and, and that's how you'd meet people and get to know people. You just, you know, you'd ask them all these questions and then I took them out for coffee. And so one day he called me up and he used to call me Joey. He goes, Joey, he was Italian. He goes, uh, there's a spot on the desk. You want it? And I said, yeah. And I got to the firm and the, the owners of the firm were these three brothers. And they said, listen, you don't know what you're doing. I, I said, I don't know how to trade at all. I said, but I have 200 clients who will do nothing but sell stock. So I was in and at three and a half to 5% commission on the dollar volume of the trade. That's how it worked back then. So, you know, right away I went from being a junior within three months, I was making about $200,000 a month in commissions. So that's how I did it. And my clients were all uh, New Yorkers, um, things like that. And, and, you know, they taught me the entire business. I learned everything from my clients. Um, and they were like, you know, you don't know anything, but we can trust you and you can't teach trust. So mm. I was their boy and I traded a lot of their offshore accounts. Um, my first client was a Swiss bank uh, because what they do is they'd finance the company, put the stock offshore, right? And then that Swiss bank would call me and I would sell stock out of Switzerland, the Cayman Islands, Hong Kong, uh, into the US markets through Vancouver, right? Uh, that's how it used to work in those old days. And um, Vancouver was technically offshore. So I could do things that U.S. traders weren't allowed to do, like direct trades to different market makers. And so you'd see a level two in a U.S. stock. It would all be me. Every single bid and offer, I would move the market makers around with orders like chess pieces on a board, right? And, um, you know, so if a stock traded, say, $10 million worth of dollar volume in a day, my client, you know, uh, like, for example, my client Moose, uh, the, the uh, Punjabi guy, he'd call me up, we used to call him Moose, and he'd say, okay, what was the volume? 10 million shares. How much did we sell? 3 million shares. Okay, see you tomorrow. Click. They didn't care about price because they had paid half a penny for the stock. We're selling it at five bucks, right? And that's how these guys would make huge amounts of money. And, you know, I'd, you know, I'd charge quite a bit in commissions. So if you know, a trade's a $100,000 trade, I charge three and a half percent, that's $3,500 for doing that one trade, right? So it was a very different business back then. And uh, I did that for a number of years. And um, then I moved up in the firm. And then they put me with a guy who was the number one producer, he was making about three to 4 million a month uh, in commissions. And he needed another trader to come and run his trading operation. So I did that. But turns out he was trading for um, well, how do I say this politely? Uh, the Italian gentlemen in New York who are, uh, if you've ever seen The Sopranos, um, you know, he was trading for <laughs> the mob and he got arrested. So that was the end of my career on the trade desk because everybody thought that, you know, the only people who wanted to deal with me were kind of nasty people. And uh, so what I did was, you know, it was tough. Um, you know, after 9-11, it was really hard. Uh, you know, I went from having, you know, two Porsches in a penthouse to living above an Irish bar and taking the bus. But I rebuilt and I got together with a friend of mine. Uh, his father was a client. He got into university. And what we did was we started taking companies public. And, you know, after about two or three years, we built ourselves back up again. And, uh, you know, so I, I did a lot of, I've done about 200 public companies where, you know, I trade out the stock. Um, and I've done about maybe like IPOs on my own with my own groups, maybe 50 or 60 uh, public companies over the years, uh, taken companies public, reverse mergers kind of thing, and then created the aftermarket to sell the stock into. So we'll work on a deal for 18 to 24 months and, you know, they'll make, you know, say 50 to $100 million and cut it up between six or seven people, right? And that's, you know, that's the deal side of things. Then unfortunately in 2012, my best friend kind of lost his mind a little bit and started going a little crazy. We started making a lot of money, right? And he was quite a bit younger. And, you know, when young kids, you know, next thing you know, you've got $30 million in equity from nothing. Um, you know, he started going a little crazy, got into trouble, and we parted ways. And uh, after that, I, it was a very stressful time for me. I had a heart attack in 2012 at the age of 44. Um, and um, I had a quintuple bypass. Um, I actually died, came back to life. So I had to figure out a way to, to do something that was a little bit more, uh, how shall I say, stress-free. And so I thought retail trading would be great. Little did I know that retail trading is the hardest job I've ever had <laughs> because you can't cheat. 
right? You can't hide trades in inventories. You can't use, you know, leverage that's not yours. You really, it's, it's a lot of discipline, which you don't have on the institutional side because you have the order flow. You want a stock to go up, you make, you know, you just cut the supply, the stock goes up. You want a stock to go down, you hammer the bids with supply and it move it down. You can move things around, right? So not having that ability to actually control the order flow was very hard. And uh, luckily, I, I traded for three weeks using candle charts. Did horribly. I lost $300 and I'm cheap. So that was enough for me. I was like, okay, I lost $300. I don't know what I'm doing. I started researching and I stumbled upon uh, Jim Dalton, the market profile um, man. And thankfully, I, I started watching all his free videos and things like that and learning market profile. That, you know, that was around 2013. And that's what I've been doing ever since. Now, I started posting on Twitter and all of a sudden people started following me. And I found market profile was very accurate. You could see levels really well. You could, you know, pinpoint exactly what's going to happen structurally. And, um, you know, then uh, a friend came up to me, uh, you know, that I made on, met on Twitter said, um, how would you like to do a podcast? So we started this podcast called Confessions of a Market Maker. And, um, and now we've got about 80 episodes under our belt and we're in the number, we're in the top 5% of all podcasts on Spotify. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. And, yeah. Uh, you know, and it's just a lot of my stories and we get good people in. We've had Mark Cuban on and Jack Schweiger and Linda Bradford Ratchie. And, and then we've gone into the crypto space and we had uh, Anthony uh, Scaramucci, the ex, um, you know, the gentleman who worked at the White House, um, you know, who's big into crypto. So we've branched out and, and did that. And then we started a trading room uh, called uh, microwefutures.com where I teach people how to trade using market structure. Okay. And as I learned, I learned how to incorporate candles. Um, and I look at candles in a very, very different <laughs> sense than most okay. people. I don't, don't use patterns or anything like that. Um, for me, the candle chart tells me what business is going on. And then we just trade alongside with the size traders who move the market because inventory is what move markets. Okay. Um, yeah. So it's been, it's been a crazy, you know, I have not had a traditional uh, way to get into this business. So um, it's, it's been interesting. I've met a lot of really interesting people and, you know, now I'm trying to teach uh, retail traders uh, how to make a living with this and, um, you know, how to manage risk, how to make a living and, you know, how to get in and out and get paid without getting hurt. <laughs> That's a super, super, uh, uh, exposure and experiences of life and uh, <laughs> glad that you're doing what you're doing. Let me start by asking this question. Uh, uh, what's your age? The, the gorilla is suggesting that your age must be around 45. I'm but 50, what's your real age? I'm 54. I'm 54. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm 54. Kidding. Yeah, born, born <laughs> in 68. And yeah, so I, uh, I'm 54 and uh, it's, and uh, just last year I, I came to London um, and, um, you know, my girlfriend's here. She's a, a doctor here. So, um, awesome. you know, um, yeah, loving not being in Canada in the winter when it's minus 50, minus 60. So, <laughs> <laughs> so and, uh, you know, what's the, what's the uh, story behind Gorilla? Why, why Gorilla? Because, uh, of well, physic, because of yeah, the physique? Because of the, yeah, because that okay. Punjabi guy called me gorilla. He's, you know, he, okay. he's, then the name stuck, um, you know. So. <laughs> and what's All the reason why, why you're sorry. hiding your identity? What's the reason? why? why you okay, the reason I don't show my face is because I've traded for Saudi Arabian arms dealers. I've traded for all sorts of crazy people. Okay. Um, if you ever saw the movie The Wolf of Wall Street, yeah. Um, when that place shut down, those brokers actually became stock promoters because they figured, why should I make a million dollars a month when I can make 10 million in a week, okay. right? This way I sell my own stock, take a company public, do a reverse merger and go, you know, print my own, you know, it's like having a bank machine for these guys. So all of these near do wells came through. Um, and, um, I used to trade for a lot of Swiss banks and things like that discretion, uh, you know, on my business card, it would say, you know, your secrets die with me. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, you know, so it's a very, very, you know, so I do, you know, I tell stories about my old clients. I change their names. Everyone's got a nickname. Um, you know, like one of my clients, I call him the penguin. Um, he's a South Indian guy who uh, made about, uh, have you ever heard of the company Briex Minerals? Nope. Um, they, they made a movie about it called Gold with Matthew McConaughey. I don't know. Uh, it was a mining deal in Canada. Uh, and this gentleman had about 5 million shares at 30 cents. The stock went to $281. Uh, 
and he made about four hundred million dollars, and that was the first deal I ever worked on uh, as a rookie. So um, I, you know, a lot of these guys are still alive, so I don't show my face and give out names and things like that, just out of respect for them and and that sort of thing. Good, good, cool. fantastic. So that's <laughs> quite a good knowledge about you and uh, what uh, you have done. You have kind of been there, done that. Now yeah. let's uh, let's get into the, the 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 knowledge sharing which we want. Sure. From, you know, VWAP. VWAP is something which you have been using for your trading, and obviously yes. you train people also on that. So could we get more insights about VWAP? And I'm glad that you have taken a few examples from Nifty, Bank Nifty. So super Certainly. excited to learn more from you. So you can do the screen sharing and we can continue the interaction. Sure, sure. Let me just get the um, the Nifty up here and share the screen. One quick minute. So you should be able to see my screen now. I'm using uh, Go yeah. Charting for Nifty. Okay. And this is a market profile chart. And market profiles, are, it's a very interesting concept uh, because what it does is it it takes the time in sales and it puts it into a two-dimensional format just like any other chart okay. but there's little tiny details that market profile shows that's really really invaluable um in, could you in uh, if you don't mind if i can ask you can we start sure. from the you know scratch how did you insert market profile what is the concept i mean just five ten minutes of basic interaction sure with sure. respect to how you created this template Okay, well, what I did was I just, I created the Nifty template. Um, what I did was, you know, you on Go Charting, you just add the market profile TPO. Okay. Okay, okay. Actually, in India, people are not, I, I'm not sure people use Go Charting so much. So is it okay if we can just show them uh, how to approach this, uh, this chart? Sure, sure. Um, like I've got Bank Nifty on here. So oh, we sure, can maybe sure. we can yeah, go yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. and add. So let's see here. If I go and put, you know, uh, a market profile chart, let's see. Um, you just add it using their software. Sure, sure. And it'll it'll put a chart up. Now, what I do is to get the levels that are useful is there's something called balance, okay. which is a very, it's kind of like a consolidation or a bracketed range that a lot of retail traders would call it. Okay. And what I do is I look for a balance range and after a while your eyes will get really used to finding it. Like my eyes right now are drawn to this range right here. Mm. Right. And what I'll do is I'll look at that range and I'll say, you know what? And I'll just make this chart a little bigger here. Mm. You see, because usually balance happens after a move higher or a move lower. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. So it moves up and it consolidates. Now I'll look at this range and I'll look at the highs and the lows mm -hmm. and I'll say, you see this high and that high and mm -hmm. these two lows here, right? I'll look at that as balance because when we, when we come to this low, we come to that high and when we can't get past that high, we come right back to that low, mm -hmm. right? So I'll draw, um, I'll draw a little, chart here hang on okay and that uh, a little sort of um, just yeah so I'll try and get these two highs here and these two lows and then the simple thing to do is just to double it when the market uh, moves off of it let me just make sure I get the levels right here so this is a 30 minute chart you follow uh, it's yeah these are 30 minute charts so what what this is let me just get rid of this for a second right this is a market profile chart and this is the structure of of the trading the shapes of these profiles tell us a lot about the interactions that are going on you see how the market got up here to about 4 40 40,600 and then it sold off this profile is like an accumulation profile the people okay. who were trapped long sold off here. Okay. Now, if you look at this profile that, that moved the market higher, mm. you can see this looks like a capital letter P, uh, and this looks like a lowercase letter B. Yeah. Okay. Now, the P profile tells you that people are short and trapped short under 39702 here. Okay. So what I would look for 
right? Because why that happened, why they're short here, is when the market took this high, it ran the stops. Mm -hmm. So people are trapped short here from this day. So when the market comes back down, there's not enough supply to fill the bids under 39.682. Right. Right. Now, if there's a large seller, it'll fill those buy orders all the way down. Okay. But if it's just uh, inventory or just you know people that are in and out of the market, the market will go up and it'll come back and it'll find bids or find support right at that level. Okay. Right. So that's a level that I'd be looking for if this thing ever fell apart. That's a place where I'd look for short covering. Now, right. the fact that the market went up and there's a gap, right? So you have a gap up here, right? This is a short position. A gap higher is a short position, right? A gap lower is supply. And as retail traders, all we need to care about is supply. Because if there's supply, we can short. If there's no supply, there's no reason for us to short. Right, mm -hmm. something very simple that nobody really talks about. Markets are just—that's why we call it the stock market because it's a market. So whether selling stock, rugs, spices, it's just a product. And what's the goal of a market? To buy a bunch of really cheap product and sell it at higher price. So here's the accumulation of the cheaper product. Then you cut the supply. The mm -hmm. market goes up because how you create demand is cutting supply. Mm -hmm. You shut off the sell here, people will push price up and you can sell into it. Then the large traders or the wholesale traders will sell the market down, but they won't go into their cost. See, their cost basis is right here. Mm. See? Mm. This is the cost basis of the size, and then this is the accumulation of that. This is the distribution, mm. right? Because that's, that's all we did. This is because all I did was I never had a retail client, right? I, all I did was. My job was to make sure if you had 10 million shares of stock in your account, after four or five weeks, the goal is to have no stock and cash. I'm liquidating that into the market. And to liquidate large size into the market, you have to sort of work the market. You know how to make a market, create buying. And buying is created by shutting off supply, right? Mm -hmm. I, I've taken a stock from $0.30 cents to $300 by myself. I've routinely done shorts, you know, squeezes. You guys are familiar with the concept of RSI. I once held a NASDAQ stock at $30 um, for three months, and the RSI was 90 RSI for three months. Mm -hmm. um, I did that by restricting supply, mm -hmm. right? And I actually engineered a short squeeze where the float was smaller than the short position. Mm -hmm. right? This holds price up. Right. So here you have price being held here at this 39,700 level. Mm. When the market goes up and comes back down, you'll notice that there's a, a point of control here. This is where the most time is spent at 39,826, and the market cannot come and get down to that level. Oh. So that's a support level. Also, if you look at the shape of this profile, you'll see that these two lows are at the same price. That's a double bottom in a B-shaped profile. So this, when you see this after a move up, the last thing you want to do is short down here mm. because the supply is shut off. And as you can see the next day, higher, mm. right? So if I was, say, if this was a stock, right, I would clean up. I would say this is $5. I'd buy everything up under five for my clients, cut the supply. My clients would initiate a retail buy program. Retail comes in, you sell it. Then you let it breathe, let it come how, back down, right? How do you? Sorry to interrupt in the middle. Uh, sorry, my I keep on. I will keep on bothering you with this. No, that's fine. That's fine. Please do. How do you judge uh, which shape as retail and which shape as institution? Well, it's it really retail. That that's really you don't need to worry about. All you need to worry about is where the buying and where the selling is going to be, because we can't move the market, right? We, we can't push the nifty around. So we need to transact where the buyers are if we want to go on. Okay, okay. And we need to transact where the sellers are if we want to go short. Because we have no power to push the market down. We need somebody to come and sell from a long position to introduce supply to push prices down. Mm -hmm. Right. So here, this blue area is where 70% 
of the volume or time has been. So these people, the people who bought at say 4318, they're stuck long. Some of them will sell out. Mm -hmm. When they sell out, you look for this and you know that there's going to be buying down here. But if the market can't even get down to this level, and then you see this double bottom, that means the supply has shut off. Mm. It's kind of strange little concepts in market profile, but what I do is I try and make it practical. So when you see a, a move up and then a B-shaped profile, you know that this is accumulation of this product that's trapped to be sold further at higher prices for profit. So I have a very basic question on market profile. Sure. So let's take only one, uh, say any profile as an example. We can yep. go to... Uh, the profile and, and the at the bottom, the twentieth, yeah, twentieth of October profile. Now this profile uh, does it represent uh, one single day or yes, it's oh. uh, they're they're thirty minute periods. So basically, all this is is a half hour candle chart. Okay, okay. Right? All all we're doing is it's a half hour candle chart, and we can actually split um, the profile, right, oh. to show you. Right, so this will split this profile to show you exactly each candle, and you can see structures. The other beautiful thing about this is you know where all the stops are. So if you, you see this, the high of that day, that's where we took the upper stops. Yeah. Short sellers would have had their stops here. Yeah. So when the market comes back down to that level, you know that there are going to be bids here because the shorts are trapped. Mm -hmm. not, a short seller is nothing more than a future buyer. Right. 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 So that's where we look to initiate our long. Mm. Right. Then once the market looks above and comes back into a level, for example, right, we would look to take a short, but where would you cover that short? You would mm. cover it on the break of this low right here. That's where the stops get run. Mm. And what I say is I call this my pinata level. Because if you break this level, all the candy above it falls out into these bids. Mm. Right. And then, you know, this is accumulation. They cut the supply once you accumulate, take it up to resell. Right. And now you've got this sort of distribution up here. Right. I'm going to put this back What's to. The, sorry, sorry to interrupt you again in the middle. No problem. So, no problem. No problem. What's this uh, blue and the orange color? Yeah. The sure. white? How, how are yeah. they different? Okay. The blue is what we call the value area. Okay. This is where 70% of the volume has traded that day. Ah. Right? The green is outside value. This white is what we call the point of control. That's where the most time has been spent. Okay. Where the most volume has traded. Right? Okay. Okay. So what all this value is, is cost basis. Mm -hmm. Right? So this cost basis is being sold here for a profit. Mm-hmm and being sold sideways up here. So after markets move higher, they tend to go sideways while you distribute. And then every time you get down to this area, the large traders who control supply, wholesalers, because in, in the US we have a wholesale system like Citadel, Virtue, these large mm -hmm. wholesalers, they buy and sell from us. They provide liquidity, right? Then we have large traders who are prop traders who act as wholesalers, mm -hmm. right? Now, I'm not sure in India uh, if that's the same, but I'm pretty sure it's kind of similar. Yeah, right? it's pretty much size, the same. Right? Yeah. So say I was long 100,000 contracts down here. I would be selling maybe 20,000 here and then just gently selling them here. Mm -hmm. So now the cost basis is down here, and we will sell as much as we can. You know, they say when the ducks are quacking, feed them. Right, so mm -hmm. the ducks being people who are coming in to buy, and we're just feeding them gently. You don't oversell because that mm -hmm. drives away the buying, mm -hmm. and this way you just gently sell and distribute your profit up here. Mm -hmm. Right? Then what happens is if if more buyers come in, this is order flow principles. You're watching the order flow. If buyers are coming in, then you just cut the supply and sell at higher prices. When buying runs out, you sell the market down to your cost basis. Right, and that's so, all trading. That's all trading is. So, if uh, that range is a distribution range, yeah, then ideally, after the end of distribution, price should have gone down, right? Yes, yeah. But the thing is, we got to remember what holds markets up after you distribute. Remember, mm -hmm. you have short positions in this market, 
that are holding it higher because every time the market comes down here, there's a buyer. Correct. Because shorts are trapped under that level. So they will go and buy at that level. So anybody who knows anything about distribution and size will just stop selling at that level and the market will creep up and you can sell higher. Mm-hmm. Right? It's, it's a beautiful thing. And any kind of charting, whether it's a candle chart or a TPO chart, it, it's all the same. It's just we are looking at um, distribution. Now, this is another software program and I'm just going to use the five-minute chart here. And you can use the five-minute chart or a one-minute chart to give you the same sort of the same sort of references. So here's just a one-minute chart of the S and P 500. Mm. Right. This is the ES futures. And here, earlier on, when London opened, we found this is a small balance range. So would we'd look above 4,006, we'd come back in down to 4,002 back up to 4,006. So if a market's choppy or slow, I teach people to sell this, buy this, sell this. When it looks below and comes back up, then we buy because it's going to go back up to the top. When it looks above and comes back in, we sell. And if it can't get to the bottom, you cover. And then when it looks back up over it, all we do is we just take this range and double it, and you will see how you can find your target. Right. Oh, but it's, this is uh, there is no application of market profile in this. It's a normal this, price pattern. This, this is just a one-minute candle chart with VWAP, three standard deviations. Can you please explain that? How? Uh, what okay. is the evidence of that? Yeah. Okay. Now VWAP in U.S. institutional trading, VWAP is everything. Now yeah. you had my buddy Brian Shannon on there. Yeah. On right, I love Brian. He got me addicted to that anchored VWAP. Yeah. You know. It, th- that anchored VWAP's like eating potato chips. You can't just eat one. I almost had four screens going because he got me. I was anchoring all over the place. So I had to calm <laughs> down on that, right? But it's very good. Now, VWAP is the institutional benchmark. Now, if you're my client and you tell me, listen, JJ, go buy me a million shares of Microsoft today, right? Mm-hmm. I will try and get you prices under VWAP. Right. If you tell me to sell a million shares... I will try and get you prices above VWAP. So you call me tomorrow to give me another trade that I can work. Yeah. Right? That's how it works. Traders are judged by their execution against VWAP. Okay. Right? So how much product can I get you under? How much product can I sell for you over? Right? Yeah. And the better prices I get with respect to VWAP, the better a trader I am because I know how to work the order. Right? Yep. Even now when companies are financed, right, say you have a pharmaceutical company and you need to raise $40 million and your company trades at $20 on NASDAQ, right? Mm-hmm. The financier will go, you know what? We'll give you $40 million at a 30% discount to 14-day VWAP. Okay. Right? Now, my clients, right, back in the old days, this is what they do. This is how I know how this all works because – if you say you had a pharmaceutical company, same situation, your stock was at $20, right? My clients would call me up and say, JJ, start the paper route, which means start shorting the stock. Mm, mm. So I would short the stock using things I really shouldn't talk about, down from $20 to about $15 to $12. Mm. Then my clients would come to you and say, you know, Vivek, you're a great guy. We love what you're doing. We love your company, but your stock's not really doing well. Mm. We'll give you... $40 million at a 40% or 30% discount to 12 mm. instead of 20. Mm. You'll say yes because it's only stock, right? And as they say in North America, paper is 15 cents a pound, right? So you'll issue my clients a whole bunch of stock at a 30% discount to $12. Okay. You see? Now we'll cover our short position, which I've been hiding in Switzerland, mm-hmm. right? Because you use offshore accounts to hide short positions in the old days, right? Now, they'll be short all the way down from 12. We cover at maybe eight, right? Mm-hmm. Eight, nine dollars. It's a beautiful profit. And then we take the rest of that stock, and then I stop pushing the stock down. We rip it back up to 20, 30, 40. We sell the rest. That's how financiers make money off of your company. Sure. Sure. But once again, VWAP is the institutional benchmark. So, what we do here in when we're trading futures, it's basically the same concept. 
This is accumulation under VWAP. This is a little flush, and then we come back up. And you can see that this 4002 to 4006, if you just double it, we hit the target 14 to the tick. And what's the logic of that steady deviation? This, the, the standard deviations are, are not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is this balance zone. Yeah. See, yeah. balance is a, is a bracketed thing. See, when you look above and come back down, you hit that low. When you can't break that low, you go right back to that high. When you can't break that high, you go right back to that low. That's a balance area. So this how is the did you, sorry to interrupt. No, so no the balance area is basically that range which you draw, right? That's the yeah, this, this, this light. Oh, okay. let, me, oh, let me make it a different color so it kind of yeah. stands out. And uh, right? so, are you using yeah. uh, your, as you mentioned, that VWAP, uh, three standard division VWAP. Are you using that also for range? Yeah, this is, VWAP is the, is the purple line. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. these blue ones are the standard deviations. Okay. Right. So, but to, to show your your listeners and your viewers how to know where the target's going to be. Yeah. This is something Jim Dalton said once and he's never repeated it. I, because I couldn't memorize candle patterns, bull flag, this flag, raccoons holding pennants, all this stuff. I, I couldn't memorize that. I need to know why something's happening. So what I look for is accumulation and distribution. Right, but balance is one of the things he said. You just take a balance zone and double it. Okay. Right, and once you double it, right, you'll know where the target is, and you can see that this balance range we got to the target to pretty much the penny. Okay. Right. So here's the balance zone. Here's double of that balance zone. It is the simplest, most clear way of knowing where your targets are and where you get acceptance and rejection, because you know. So you're looking to short. Once you get to that top of this balance, you know that if the market can't break that, you're shorting this, right? Your stop, you would be that standard deviation here. So you'd be yep. short 14. Your stop would be 15. And then what you do is once that short is initiated, you look to see if we can break 10. Now, if you're a short scalper, you can take your profits at 10. If you are a longer time frame trader, you can stay in this trade because when it comes back up, it can't get back up to your entry. You see, it gets okay. to 12 and it looks above 12 and then it comes back in. So when it breaks VWAP, you'd be looking to buy it back here. Now, if you're a longer time frame trader and you have a longer, you have a larger account, you can handle the swings, you can stay because this is a one minute chart. You can stay in this trade until it breaks VWAP because what has happened is now supply has built up over VWAP and it is selling off, right? It's, yeah. all, it's all supply. Markets are nothing more than supply. There are only times when we get initiative buying by investment banks, like investors, like BlackRock. That's why after uh, the COVID crisis, the market rebounded to new highs. The reason is, there's a very, very good reason that nobody ever talks about, and I don't understand why. The market fundamentally shifted its revenue model from a commission-based revenue model in the 80s and 90s and 70s to a asset gathering based revenue model. Got it. So if you look at BlackRock, they have what, $10 trillion under management. Got it. They have, own a billion shares of Apple, right? Okay. It, that stock is not traded actively every day. It's taken out of the public float and put at BlackRock and they're holding it, as Brian Shannon said, time frames. Right. Right. They are looking to hold that stock for 20 to 30 years. Mm -hmm. Therefore, that stock does not get traded out. Secondly, that stock gets paid for in cash, so it's not subject to margin calls. Mm -hmm. Right? So it's an asset that's owned for a long period of time. So after when COVID was happening, BlackRock was not selling Apple. Fidelity was not selling Apple. State Street was not selling Apple or Microsoft, right? So because their time frame to hold an investment and their investors as opposed to traders is a 30-year time frame, we call that locking up the paper. That paper is locked up. If you look at Apple, it's got 16 billion shares in the floating supply of the company, which is in DTC, in the Depository Trust Company, right? There's 16 billion shares available for trading, of which look at the daily trading volume in Apple. It's less than 100 million shares. Less than 1% of the float trades. That's why these stocks have huge ranges. 
They don't liquidate for long periods of time because it's all momentum trading, it's just like the S&P. Now, I'm not sure if, if the Nifty is the same thing and those companies are held, but I'm sure you have pension funds in India, just like everywhere else. Right? Yeah, so you know, know. India's structure is that most of the stocks are still owned by the promoter, so it's not available as free float. And very yeah. few percentages are available, so that's why stock prices behave quite uh, aggressively in yes. stocks where free float is less. Yeah, so this balance thing is great. Now, if, if we had broken down and went lower, you just double the range to find your lower target. It's very simple, you know. Yeah, uh, it looks so it, simple. Can can we it, try? Can we have a look at this uh, with a Nifty chart? Is it possible? Sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I did it on the uh, on the Nifty. Oh wow. So, yeah. So this so this is just the ES. It's just a simple way of looking at it. Let me just bring back my Nifty chart. So there there's Nifty. We can do that, and I've done it here. That's the Bank Nifty. I'll yeah, do it. Yeah. And this is how I came up with it on Nifty. Um, okay. I was looking at Nifty, oh gosh, a while back. Let me see where it was. And I, this was my original balance range, right? So I found a balance range, and that's this blue area here, mm -hmm. right? And we just, let me see. I can, yeah, I think it was, it was around here. I looked at this low and that high. And when you hit that low and you look below it, do you come back up to that high? Yeah, then you look above it and you come back down to that low. So that's a balance range. And then I just doubled it and doubled it to the upside and the downside. The levels kind of worked out really nicely. And then you do the middle of that range and then you just can keep cutting it over and over again in half and half and half to get very, very nice tradable levels. I, I have a, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, but I'm not able to understand how did you arrive at the range because you oh, have okay. not marked the high and low. You have marked uh, the probable levels where the high is there. Oh, no, uh, here it is. Here, here's the balance range right here, right here. So this right? is, so, uh, is, this, uh, is this an indicator or something which is there? No, no, no. You can use candles, right? Okay. Okay. Let's, we, can, we can do it using, you know, anything else here. I'll... I'll, I'll I'll open up um, uh, an equity chart and yeah. we'll show you, we'll, we'll do an equity. Sure. So um, what I do is I looked at that low and that high, right? So how, how did you arrive at that low and high? Uh, because what I do is after a while, your eye will be trained to look for this. Okay, sure. So yeah. at first it seems really weird and strange and oversimplified, right? Yeah. But when you first come in and you look at it, I look at this low here from this day and that low, and they're pretty much the, the same. Oh, okay. Right? Okay. 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 Then I look at that high. Then I'll look for highs. So if we come down and see how we came underneath that low and came back up mm -hmm. in this day here, right? This is yeah. what Dalton calls a look below and fail. Okay. So if it's a true balance range, right, we will go up to a high from that okay. range. So we looked below, we came up to that high, we couldn't get back. What did we do? We came back and looked underneath that level. The next day, you see that low? It's mm -hmm. exactly at that same level. And then when we go up, it goes right back up to that high. Then you look above that high and you come right back to that low. But when you look up to that high, you made a trade, right? And uh, I'm sure well, the stop loss got hit in that trade, isn't it? Uh, it depends on how you trade it. See what I do, right? So I look at here, I'll just draw it out. So I'll be looking at these two lows. Mm -hmm. And then when you look below that low, you go to that high and then you come back and look below and you come back into that range and you go right back to that high. Mm -hmm. Right? So how I trade this is I don't short here. Mm -hmm. When it comes back under this level, then I take this short here. Mm -hmm. My stop is up here, depending on your risk. And then I'll look to the middle of the range for my exit, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And if it breaks the middle of my range, then I know it's going to come sorry, back to that level. Sorry, I, I, I just lost you for a couple of minutes. No problem. Uh, no problem. What happened, yeah. So. so, yeah. So now what we'll do is we'll, we'll take this and we'll draw it. We'll go to a, an equity chart. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And we'll take a look at, at um, just a simple equity chart. Now, I've got this for Apple, right? Uh, these are my levels for Apple, right? So initially, I had a balance level, 
and then I doubled it right, to get the target. And you'll see that the levels are really quite responsive. Now let's go and do a chart uh, for something new. Uh, let me see here. I, I had Redfin, right, RDFN. And so here's a stock. It's, it's a $5 stock. It's kind of been popular lately. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw, I'm going to look for balance, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So usually what I'll do is I'll, my eye is immediately drawn there to this sort of yeah. bracketed level, right? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, another place is kind of here, another place yeah. is here. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll start out here and I'll just draw a rectangle, right? Okay, yeah. Let's just see and see if, now you got to experiment with these and see, you know, if they're going to work. Right, and I'm just using that high and that low. Yeah. Right. Now, if it works, right, what you do is you just copy and move it down now to see how there's double of that balance. So there's the target. So if it broke this level, yeah. right? Let's let's make this blue for balance, right? And we'll make these red because it's lower. Right. Right. So if a market breaks that level, say, what, what is that level? Let's just. Uh, so it breaks 573. Mm. I know that my target is down here at 444. Mm. And you'll see when we came out of 573, we went to 444 to the tick, mm. right? So then, you know, this way it's it's easy to just look at these levels and, you know, you'll know now we flushed the market out because, you know, the market sold off. You got the trapped longs, you know, and any, even a candle chart. If I look at a candle chart, I know that these people above 573 are trapped they're going to come and sell the market down, right? So when do you redraw this? I mean, because you have taken that here's, as a base. Here's, here's something that's really cool. Once you get these levels, yeah. you never, ever have to redraw them. Oh. Right? You just keep expanding them. And I'll show you. See? So now that's two. So you'd have four of these. But, you know, four would take it under $3, and they wouldn't want that because – Everybody who trades American stocks should know that $5 is the magic number, right? Because okay. in U.S. equity trading, if a stock's under $5, hedge funds, mutual funds, nobody will touch it, yeah. right? Because it's penny stock status and you can't borrow money against it. It's, okay. uh, right? So the market sells off and then you can just use these levels. If it looks below 316 and comes back up, then you know the target is 444. Once you establish over 444, your target is 573. Hmm. Now we now the market looked above balance and came back in. So now you just wait to see whether it comes back to 509. So how do you deal with the false range breakout? Oh, you know what a false breakout is? Mm -hmm. It's a stop run. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, a stop run. See, the large traders who are long here run the stops of that high to cause buying and they sell their product into it. It's true. Right? So how, I, how, I used to do it all the time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You just cut the supply, sweep the book, take the stops, and then once the price goes up, you hammer it back down. Right? Yeah. So th that that's all we do now. If you come and take a look at this, if you see these levels here, these are my S and P 500 levels for the ES, and you will see these levels I came up with in April of 2020. Uh, all I do, and I'll show you my original balance range. My original balance range was down here. 27.49 three quarters to 28.10. Oh my and then God. I, and then I doubled it and I doubled it and I doubled it. And you'll be amazed how accurate this is. It is, you know, not to be rude, but it's, as we say in Canada, it's simple hillbilly math, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> right? It's just take a range, double it, and then just cut it. And then you get all these levels. And you will see like that 40.15 half, that's my top and that's the overnight high in the ES, right? So you know that to break that level, you need a lot of buying, you know, and these profiles, they, they just tell you so much, you know, 
Um, you get a balance level, like for example here, I had a balance range from 3763 to 3854. When we broke out of it, I just doubled it and 4040 was my upper target and we hit 4038 and a half. How is it possible what you're doing? It is, it is so, I mean, apparently it looks so, so Simple. Random, random range. I mean, and it's working so fine. How is it possible? It's, you know, the thing is these markets are traded by algorithms. Everything yeah. is math. I am, I did, I'm not a math guy, right? Which is, you know, I, I'm going to lose my honorary uh, East Indian card because, you know, my math is not that great. But <laughs> <laughs> so I like simplicity, right? Because most of our guys are engineers and differential equations and, you know, all that sort of thing. But it is so simple. People actually don't believe. When I came up with this, when I actually came up with these levels, and I've been using them for years, uh. um, it took me six months to actually take trades on them because okay. the market would go to my level to the penny, okay. hit it, and I was like, no, it's not going to work. And then it would sell off from that level. And okay. I was like, it took me a long time to actually trust the levels, right? But the thing is, I was looking after my mom in Saskatchewan in the last before I moved to London, mm. and I had about four years where I did nothing for like 18 hours a day except sit in front of these charts. Oh, my God. Right? Well, it, when it's minus 60 outside and you're a single guy, you don't really have anything to do. <laughs> if you go outside, you freeze to death. So you're, you know, you're homeward. But, you know, you ask anyone who lives in the middle of Canada, yeah. you know, you're home a lot. So <laughs> it took me years to come up with this. And now what I try and do is I try and, and simplify trading for people so they're not trying to memorize 30 patterns or use 40 indicators or because I've seen, just seen heartbreaking stories of people losing money, um, you, know, uh, you know, trying to figure out this business. It's, it's heartbreaking. You know, it, on my side, when people blow up a hedge fund, um, you know, they'll, they'll go through $3 billion and blow it. And then what they do is they'll go to France for the summer and have a nice time, come back, raise more money and go again. When we, you know, blow up an account, it's horrible. It's just, you know, it's life shattering, right? Um, so I really, you know, I hate seeing people in pain. And what I like to do is try and simplify this so you can take, you know, what I try and teach people to do is try and make, when you're first starting out, we have the micro future, which is a dollar and a quarter a point. And so if you have a bad day, you'll lose 30 or $40, right? As opposed to three or 400 or 500 in the e-mini, right? Which is a great learning tool. And then you learn how to be consistent. Then you switch to the mini. And that's, you know, for people who like to trade US product. I don't know if there's a, a product like that in India, but if you can learn how to trade, because retail trading is really about learning what to do is it, retail trading when you first start is all about keeping your money until you know what you're doing, yeah. right? Yeah. That, that's what it is. You know, it's like a lot of people think it's easy and it's, it's you know, passive income. You know, it's like if I went to a, a neurosurgeon and said, hey, you know, I want to do some brain surgery for quick money. Let's go. Yeah. Right? They'd, they'd laugh you right out of the operating theater, right? They wouldn't even let you in. They think this guy's nuts. People come into this business, and this is a business. It's not an art. It's not a science. It's a business, right? Uh, they come into this business completely unaware of why price moves. If you understand why price moves, then at least you're not going to get turned around, and you're not going to be buying up here, right, when you should be buying in this area here for a move up. Yeah. Because all, all it is, if, as soon as I look at a chart, any chart, all I do is I know where inventory is trapped. Trading is all about inventory right? You can see how this market flushed all the way down the nifty down to that 15,000, right? We couldn't get to 15,004. We balanced, right? Because what happened was these people were all trapped. They sold out. This is accumulation back up to distribution. That's all it is, mm -hmm. right? That, that's all we're doing. You know, it's, it's nothing more than that. And knowing where, that's why people always short at the lows and get trapped or they buy at the highs and get trapped because they don't know the business that's taking the price to the high or the business that's taking the price to the low, right? And uh, it's, it's something that uh, yeah, I've only been teaching for about three years, three and a half years, um, you know, in a room. We get about a thousand people in our room and in both rooms in our equity and our futures room. And I, I'm learning how to teach every day.
you know uh, that's that's the hard part how to how to teach people without confusing them and make yeah. it actionable and they can actually make money off it simply without you know because the worst is to go into a, a trading um, you know room or these things and these guys are talking about this and fractals and all sorts of things and people poor people just get so confused you know they don't know which way to turn when trading's all about I always say trading's all about supply don't worry about the demand we'll take care of the demand all you need to do is find out if there's supply. If there's supply, we can short. If there's no supply, you have no business shorting a market with no supply. Great. So yeah. basically, if I have to kind of summarize this uh, discussion, so mm -hmm. using market profile, you are finding the demand and the supply exactly. capacity or the depth, and you are using these uh, ranges to execute the transaction. Correct? Exactly. Exactly. That's uh, pretty scientific. Yeah, very scientific. It looks yeah. so logical. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I'm thanking you for introducing this concept to me because I'm going to start practicing this. I'm going to learn more about market profile because I, I think this this baby gonna, needs a bit of more learning, isn't it? The reason why market profile has not caught on until my friend SD, who's also from India, uh, he, this is his charting software, uh, Go oh. Charting. The yeah, other where one, is he, where is he based out of? Which, which uh, he he's in Europe right now, I think. Okay. If memory okay. serves. But uh, it's a new software program. It's only like 20 bucks a month, right? Uh -huh. It's web-based. And, you know, I'm going to give him a little plug because he's a great guy. The problem with Market Profile is the other software that you see, and I love these guys, but this is called Sierra Chart, and it is insanely difficult to set up, mm. right? Uh, this is right away. It's quick. And so what I'm trying to do is now he's going to be doing, he does equities, um, you know, so you can, you can go and look at, you know, something like Apple, hmm. oh, sorry, right. And quickly get a profile chart and you'll be able to see, um, the structure in Apple, right? So right now I can look at Apple and I go, Oh, look at this, right? Here's the accumulation. The market sold off, right? Product was accumulated here between 134 and 142, mm. and now it's being distributed at higher prices. When mm. the market comes down, you'll notice that these double bottoms in both of these profiles show that the supply cut off right before $140. Right. Right. And then rip right back up. Now, it'll show you where the short positions are, too. Right. Yeah. So, this little area here where they have single prints or single set of letters between distributions. Because all these are is what they call a, a distribution like a, uh, a bell curve, just flipped over on its side, right? So here where you have these single prints between distributions, that's where the shorts are trapped. So you'll notice when the market came back down, it came to the penny of where the shorts are trapped here, in this day here. Mm -hmm. So the shorts are trapped in Apple under 145. Mm. That's why there's support at 145. Because support are buy orders, resistance mm. is sell orders. Mm. that's all it is that's right and so when, when does resistance become support right resistance becomes resistance here becomes support when the large traders own all of the position here mm. Mm. that's mm. all it is right you know I, I like to teach people to reason their way through this because it's really not that complicated execution now is the problem execution i call execution a marathon that's a lifelong thing Right, because we're always the market's changing. We have to adapt to the market and learn how to execute new ways, shorter time frames. Like in, if it's a choppy market, I'll sh trade a shorter time frame. If it's a nice slow market with steady buying, we can take longer term trades. Right, and I teach people how to tell the difference between the order flow of choppy buying versus order flow of a nice stable buy. Right. Very interesting. Very interesting, JJ. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, people need to see this video again because, uh, you know, there are so many things which you have actually mentioned through very simple sentences. But uh, to connect the dot, people have to see this video again to it, relate it, the market yeah. profile and the entire concept of demand and yeah. supply. Yeah, it's, think, it's you know, the thing about trading is that unfortunately we have a lot of people who teach trading who's never worked in the industry. Yeah. Right. And they come up with all these crazy things and, and God bless them, but there's so much simplicity. I mean, markets have been around for th hundreds of years, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, Commodore Vanderbilt in 1873 
mm. short squeezed Harlem Railroad from thirty dollars up to almost a thousand dollars a share. Mm -hmm. He did it by buying all the stock under a hundred bucks and limiting supply. Mm -hmm. Right? Elon Musk and Tesla did the short squeeze of the century, but do you know something? That short squeeze of Tesla when they took it to a thousand the first time was a hundred years on the anniversary of the Stutz Automotive short squeeze of 1920. Oh my God. Right? Where Thomas Fortune Ryan did the exact same thing a hundred years ago. In oh. fact, with Stutz, he, he had so many people upside down that the New York Stock Exchange suspended trading in the stock because the brokerage firms would have gone bankrupt. Mm -hmm. And he had to go to court to get them to cover. True. Right? So nothing is ever new. You know, and Elon was brilliant. He, you know, he convinced everybody who was crazy. They shorted the stock. Bailey Gifford was the bank. They bought all the stock. They bought all the supply, shut the supply and the thing rocketed. Mm. You know, I did a report when the stock was three, four hundred dollars telling people, please don't short this. And it went to a thousand, you know. Yeah. Fair point. JJ, <laughs> I think uh, this is, this is very fascinating. I think from first level knowledge perspective, I think you have given so much to us. Uh, that we need some time to absorb what you have given to us. So I'm going to make some notes for myself and start practicing this. I must I'd thank you. I must thank I'd you. I'd, I'd love to extend an in invitation to you. I'd love you to come into our trading room. I do a Zoom every day, three hours. I do one at 7.30 a.m. GMT, the London Open. And then I do one at 9 o'clock, um, 9 o'clock Eastern time. New York time and we do I teach for three hours every day on zoom so all these it's it's all of this is just repetition 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 you know sure, sure. that's all it is there's this is not rocket science you know yes yes yeah. and the same thing which has been taught again and again under new market yeah. situation makes us much, exactly. much more comfortable with that concept exactly so exactly. I love to you know get inside your room one day and learn. yeah I'll send you. you I'll send you a link definitely thank you yeah, thank please you. please Please be our guest and, you know, we, we'd love to have you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, JJ and uh, Akka Surinder. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for giving Thank this you amazing so much. sweet capsule to us. And um, I'm sure we'll have a lot of follow-on questions. So yeah. we'll try to send you a few questions from our serious learners so sure. that you can probably connect with them or answer their queries as yeah, well. Yeah, sure. We have a Discord. Also, you can get me at vwaptrader1 is my Twitter. Okay. Um, you know, uh, message me anytime. I try and answer all my messages. And awesome. Um, yeah, we we'd love to see you. And uh, one of these days, I'll make it to India. I've been to Sri Lanka, but I I'll, I'll come and visit. What city are you in? Yeah, I'm in Calcutta. Oh, okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Cool. Cool. So yeah. we'll definitely love to host you someday when you are in yeah. India, or we'll uh, definitely like to invite you to India and share you. this knowledge in depth with everyone. Thank you, sir. It's, thank it's you. Been a thank pleasure. you. Thank you, JJ. Thank you so much for accepting my invitation and giving this beautiful one. My pleasure. Thank you for having Thank me. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank you.